Welcome to the Owner's Box. We have a special show for you today. We have Susan Laughlin, who started her career with the Devil Wears Prada and is in a great part of her career, having launched a wonderful brand in the food space. I'm your host, David Williams. I'm going to lead you on this journey. I'm joined with my co-host and sponsor from the Empower Lab, Don Piero. Good morning, Don. Good morning. I, too, am excited about hearing your journey, uh, Susan, and where it started and where it is today. So let's jump right in with what does the Devil Wears Prada mean to you? It sounds a little bit more glamorous than it is when you're actually living through it. Um, I thought I landed my dream job when I moved out to California in L.A. in the fashion industry and was quickly disillusioned in many ways, but also was a great part of my journey um, for the most part and helped me get to where I am now. Very good. So w- were there like takeaways working in that vi- environment that kind of led to who you are today? Yeah, absolutely. For one, I learned exactly the type of leader that I never wanted to be. I also learned a great deal about entrepreneur space and product development and wholesale sales and what it took to really move a brand forward. So a lot of it helped me get to where I am today. So what was it like there? Uh, Well, there was some really great camaraderie with Uh, my fellow staff and employees we worked really closely together it was a small company so because of that we got to kind of dabble in every part of the business which was really great learning wise but it was definitely uh, a toxic environment you know culturally describe that a little bit describe that (laughs) well there was you know there was days where many people were in tears um there was a lot of pressure, a lot of uh, discipline, and a lot of what felt like irrational or unempathetic business decisions from the top down. You know, um, just to jump in with a, uh, with a thought, um, I, I, I've come across a lot of CEOs or, or especially um, small business owners who, are, uh, who lack self-awareness, mm-hmm. and they're so driven to their vision. And, and in this case, the company that you work for, I'm familiar with, and they had a great product and a great vision. Um, but I think that the lack of self-awareness on, some, on the part of some leaders makes it, makes it really challenging for the staff to live up to those expectations. Just looking back, if you were to like be able to tap that person on the shoulder as a leader of a, of a new organization, what, what would you say to her? Yeah, I think it, it's lack of awareness, but it's also fear of loss of control. And so I think when you have a vision and you're trying to execute that vision and there's really high stakes to making that succeed, it can bring out fear and that can result in controlling or micromanaging or different types of management that's unhealthy culturally. So my biggest thing would be, you know, no one's out to get you. We're all here to help move your vision forward. And if you actually let people uh, use their strengths, that they can innovate and help grow the company farther than you can alone. Did you, um, did you learn any managing up skills? Like such a uh, challenging leader, you got to find ways to manage up. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I definitely learned to do my job and do it really well. And I learned to know what the expectation was and what I could present in a way that I knew would be pleasing to my boss. So learning how to read somebody else and knowing what makes them tick and what makes them uh, go with your ideas, for sure, learn those skills really early on. I think everybody at that company did. <laughs> You eventually left that job. I did. What were the straws that broke the camel's back? Um, I had tried to leave for a while and just was a tough economy at that point. I think that was around 2008, 2009. So it was right when the economy was not doing really well. And I had gotten pregnant and went on maternity leave. And when I returned from maternity leave, my job actually was given away, (laughs) which I think is illegal, pretty sure. (laughs) But um, the loss of my position at the company actually turned out to be a blessing. I was moved into the product development department 
And that is where I learned all about sourcing and packaging and everything that I've needed to launch my uh, company at this point. So I stayed for another nine months after I came back from maternity leave, was commuting actually from San Diego to Long Beach, and was a very hard nine months, but I needed that uh, to fill my journey now. So what was your next stop? So my next stop was totally unconventional. I went to work for an international bridge engineering firm, which was a far cry from the fashion industry. (laughs) And um, I went into operations there and learned everything I needed to learn about the back of the house. So I did all HR, payroll, learned all QuickBooks and invoicing and all of the, you know, really behind the scenes of running a business. And how was the management style at this business comparative to your earlier experience? It was night and day. Uh, A, I came from a fully uh, woman-operated, ran business. All women worked there, and the next company was all men. There was about four women at the entire company, most of which were like administrative, administrative staff. And the company had a real plethora of employees that were there for a really long time. They were extremely generous. They were really good to their employees, and it showed in the loyalty of their staff. So, Susan, after I think it was four years at that job, Mm -hmm. you made another dramatic shift to a complete startup. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so after I worked for the engineering firm, a friend of mine had started a commercial preschool company, so they were uh, opening preschools, and they really needed a finance person to come in and help manage and clean up their financial reporting. So I jumped ship and got my first uh, taste of the entrepreneur life and went to their company and handled all of their financing, all of their HR, payroll, book, QuickBooks, and everything finance for them. So you went from the devil to the angel to a friend. Yeah. Now, what was that like? Uh, working for friends, I think, can be challenging. I don't know if I recommend it, depending on your relationship with your friends. Um, your, your relationship can change quickly. It was another really great experience, but um, the the culture was, again, uh, not as great as the stable environment that I had grown used to. I think there's a common thread with entrepreneurs. You know, you're so intent on moving your vision forward that it's very easy to steamroll over your employees or squash them and have your vision be dominant without, you know, sitting back and and really acknowledging what other people are bringing to the table. It seems like your your early experience really had a cultural emphasis for you. Uh, How would you, how would you characterize that as you think back through it? Yeah, I think culture is really important in a company and I'm not like a touchy feely person. Like I don't need you to make me feel good and, and do all that. But, but, just showing an employee that they're appreciated and that what they bring to the table matters and trusting them enough to listen to their opinion or what they have to say, it could change the entire face of your company. Where along this journey in the three experiences, where, where did the bug for entrepreneurialism bite you? Did it start at the beginning or did it happen sort of along the way? Yeah, so it started small and then it just kept growing. I always say that if you have that entrepreneurial thing inside of you, it's like a fire that you cannot put out. And so you can you can push it away for a little bit. But at some point, you're going to have to act on it because the burning desire does not go away. And if you know, you know. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. And apparently you knew. Yeah. <laughs> so so after this job, it was still another move, right? Next, yes. Next step. What? Yeah, so next step, I actually, uh, the culture kind of got bad enough where I had to make a, a move. And so I just started applying to jobs and applied to a job at a university in San Diego. And they called me the next day for an interview. And it was kind of a really quick transition. And so I uh, went on board as the director of student accounts for Point Loma Nazarene University. 
And it really helped. I, I say that they nursed my professional wounds because I had a team and it validated everything that I brought to the table professionally and that I was smart and I did have a lot to offer and I could lead a team and bring a lot to the table and it it felt appreciated there. Sounds like it was your first chance to try your hand at being the leader. Yeah, absolutely. And I experienced all different uh, type of leadership development and strengths training and emotional IQ and just a, a lot of development that went into me personally. So while you were there, uh, you decided to get even more involved with Point Loma. I did. I decided to go back and get my MBA, um, which was funny because my GPA in college was not good and never, ever thought about going back to get my master's. And then when you work for a university, there's a great perk called tuition remission where you get a discount on your schooling. So I called the MBA department just to ask a few questions about it. And a month later, I was fully enrolled in starting the program. So I kind of I got blindsided and sucked in. But it was one of the best things I ever did. Yeah. What was the biggest benefit to that program for you? The biggest thing for me is there was twofold. One, it brought the full picture together for me for business. So I had experience in product development. I had experience in sales. I had experience in finance and HR. And the MBA program really shows how all of those aspects of a company come together, you know, to produce the balance sheet and the profit and loss statement and the financials of a company and how important each role impacts those. So it really brought it full circle for me. The second thing was it gave me the confidence of starting my own business again because I had all the tools as many tools you could possibly have to start a business I had at this point so there's no reason why I couldn't start something and be successful at it or so so, so I thought (laughs) so right here I have a picture of your entrepreneurial pilot light yeah lights your entrepreneurial burner Mm -hmm. and off you go yeah tell us about that what happened how did Yeah, so I had the idea of my company, which is called Nut Crumbs, uh, or my product, and it's a nut-based breadcrumb alternative. So I am a an avid cook. I love to cook. I'm always cooking on the weekends. I watch every cooking show on the planet. And I had uh, after I had my first son, I had a really hard time losing my baby weight. And I'm from the East Coast, so I cook breaded everything. And so I was searching for a breadcrumb that was paleo and I couldn't find one. So I started making it myself in my kitchen. And that's where my idea came from. And I was cooking it for friends and family and it was so delicious. And I couldn't figure out why nobody else had put something like that on the market. So I knew that was like my million dollar idea, but I just kind of pushed it away for a couple of years. And when I was halfway through my MBA program, I was like, now's the time. I'm actually going to do it. So on March 8th of 2017 is when I made the plunge. I filed for my business. Uh, I forget exactly. I think it was my LLC that I filed for on that day. And I committed to pushing forward with with my business. Susan, when I started my first company, I used to um, actually take the chemicals and put them inside of a... uh, an igloo cooler or one of those like Gatorade style uh, jugs and I would stir it with a stick and I'd fill my bottles one at a time and and I I don't even know how that came to me how did this product come to you how did you make your first item yeah so it was this, I remember it vividly it was a Sunday and I ran out to Costco and I bought a Cuisinart food processor because the coffee grinder, you know, is yay big and can only make so much product at a time. And I I made my first batch of nut crumbs. So I put a bunch of nuts in there and spices, and I actually started measuring it out this time so I could finalize my recipe and just made the first batch in my kitchen. And and who, who is the, the test guinea pig to, to try your product and give you some validation? Yeah, so I have three boys and a husband, and they were my first go-to. And everybody, even the kids, liked it. So I was like, this is pretty good if I can get my kids to eat nuts on chicken. <laughs> and so how do you scale that up? Yeah, so that was a whole nother learning experience because the food business is highly regulated. So there was quite a bit of permitting 
and licensing that I had to get before I could actually sell my first bag. So it took me uh, from March to August to get all of my permits, licensing, and secure a commercial kitchen to actually make the product in because I wasn't able to make it in my kitchen and sell it. So that process was quite a long time. I remember I thought I was ready to rock. My website was ready. The packaging was ready. And I learned there was one more, I think it was called the food process food registration permit that I had never heard of that I didn't have. And that took another four weeks to get. So it was quite a bit of uh, learning and getting all of those certifications. And when you started this thing, what kind of funding did you have? I had, this is a good story, we just bought a new house, it wasn't new house, it was new to us, and it had this totally obnoxious Michael Phelps swim spa, like hot tub basically, but it had current so you could work out in it, and so my husband said, hey, you can, we can sell this hot tub because our realtor told us it was worth like $20,000 and you can use whatever money we get from the hot tub to start your business, and I was like, okay, great. So sure enough, list it. Well, no one's in the market for a $20,000 used hot tub, apparently. So we finally sold it. It took like three months, and we ended up selling it for $5,000 cash. And that is what I opened my bank account with, my business bank account, $5,000, which went really quick, by the way. <laughs> so um, remi- remembering 30-plus years ago when I started my business, um, I filled bottles uh, one at a time at night, and then I went to the um, Orange County swap meet and sold these things, uh, one bottle at a time. How did you How did you start to develop a customer base? Like, wh- where did that come from? Yeah, similar. Because when I listened to your story, I, it resonated with me so much because I started in the farmers markets, and so I would go. I would wake up at three thirty, four o'clock in the morning. I would go to the commercial kitchen and make as many bags of nut crumbs as I could. And then I had these giant Tupperware, they're probably wrapping paper Tupperware bins that I would, they fit the product perfect. And so I would put them in there and then I would leave the commercial kitchen by 7.30 to get to work by eight, my nine to five job or eight to five job. And then I would work all day um, and then I was still getting my MBA. So I would go to class two nights a week as well. And then on Saturdays is when I started uh, working the farmer's market. So I would go, we'd have to be set up by seven on Saturdays. And that's when I got to interact with my customers and have them taste the product in little souffle cups and get immediate uh, feedback on whether or not people liked it. So did it take right off, walk in the park kind of thing? It did. I remember my first farmer's market. um, I showed up and like, I'm like, go big or go home, right? So I show up, I have my booth, my banner, my um, signage. And the lady next to me was selling chimichurri. And she was, you could tell she was already annoyed with me um, because everything was branded. And then I took off my sweatshirt and I had a a t-shirt with my logo also on it and she looked at me and she goes are you kidding me <laughs> and she was, <laughs> but like I was there to start a business I wasn't there to be in the farmer's market for the rest of my life you know what I mean <laughs> sure. yeah well in your in your earlier experience you know you dealt with a fantastic brand and, and how important branding is and so obviously yeah. that was that was playing a role in your in your launch yeah and what's funny is we used to be required to wear our branded t-shirts at every trade show in the fashion industry and it was so annoying because everybody was dressed so nice and we had to wear these dorky logo t-shirts and now I'm doing the same thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so um, I, I, I know that you're in Whole Foods and Gelson's with your product, um, but I want to take it back for myself to see how it uh, measures up with, with, with your experience. Early in, in my career or my business, I kept saying, well, if I just get this one account, it's going to change everything. And every time I got an account, it didn't change everything. And, and things got more complicated and more challenging. And there was no magic wand that made things just go. What was your experience? Same. I th- I've had a list of accounts that I've wanted to get in. Obviously, Whole Foods was on the very top of that list. And I thought, you know, as soon as we get in Whole Foods, it will, you know, we'll have made it. And I remember the day I found out, I recorded a video. It's on my Instagram of how excited I was that we got into Whole Foods. And 
it was just very anticlimactic. I mean, I'm so grateful to be on their shelves and it's a great brand to be associated with, but by no means did that you know, make me arrive as a business. I remember the same thing, early days, got it going, you know, all this work to get it prepared. And then it was like, where's the money? Yeah, where's the well, money? Well, I think we're, this is a really salient point because uh, those who are thinking about becoming an entrepreneur or, or those that are already in, in business and, and they're thinking this way, which is that usually there is never any one account that just makes it all. It's just, it just doesn't happen. Occasionally it does, but for the most part, it's a grind and, and it's a grind for a long time. And I think you're in the grind still. Yeah, I'm definitely still in the middle of the grind. I feel like I'm closer to a tipping point now. Uh, my company should potentially be profitable this year. But to what you said, it's really been a culmination of a lot of smaller accounts and little things. So my success this year won't be because of Whole Foods. It won't be because of one account. It will be because of the five years of consistency that I've put into the business. And now, you know, we have multiple different revenue channels and those combined are, are what will make the company profitable this year. So I, I want to ask a very challenging question. And, and that is a small company, startup, doesn't have a lot of cash, in a category that has some very big players. Mm -hmm. um, what's your thoughts around one of the big guys copying you and just putting a ton of money into it? And, you know, has that happened? Tell us about that. Yeah, it just happened, I think, two months ago. Uh, one of the big guys, I don't know if I'm allowed to say their name or not. <laughs> yeah, Diamond Nuts. They totally copied my product. Um, I found out about it because my customers were outraged on Instagram and tagging me in, in their uh, social media post. And I mean, copied my colors, my flavors. They have an original flavor, which is my flavor because it's the first flavor that I ever, it was the original. So there it doesn't mean an, a flavor to anybody else but me. And that hurt. I cried a lot that day because you know it's been five four and a half years of blood sweat and tears and for them it was probably assigning you know one of their staff members to a product development piece and were able to develop it so really hard but I quickly you know changed my perspective and was like listen this is a new space and they probably have the marketing funds to educate the population about this space and so potentially my business could benefit from their marketing spend. So that reminds me of that great quote from Napoleon Hill in Think and Grow Rich. Mm -hmm. Behind every adversity is an equal or greater opportunity. And it sounds like you found it. Yeah, I mean, with every, every adversity that I've ever faced, there is always, always a silver lining. And you have to look for it. And it usually causes you to pivot or innovate. And that's never a bad thing. Yeah, I'm going to agree with your outlook on this. I, I think you're you're spot on with your with w the way you're looking at this, and I think this company will take a space and grow that space for you with their marketing funds. Um, I think they'll create consumer awareness, and consumers are going to gravitate to the best product, um, and you're you're going to become discovered as a result of uh, you know their efforts. Uh, here's what I would say to you or anyone who's been sort of copied, for lack of a better word, and that is. You got to constantly innovate. You got to be ahead of this. Hey, I think it's great that they're doing this. Your business is going to grow as a result. But what's next is what I would be thinking about and, and looking for that blue ocean always. Mm, yeah. Speaking of blue ocean, if you had a magic wand and mm -hmm. you could wave it over your business, what would you use that magic wand to do right now? Well, right now, my magic wand would be to find an investor or a partner. Um, and by partner, I don't necessarily mean individual. It could be a company. Um, I'm a one-woman show. I have one employee who helps do order fulfillment. So it's a lot to manage, especially as the company grows, the, you know, all different aspects of the business. And so to have somebody come in and help share some of that burden, especially someone with expertise in a particular area, would be really helpful. And I feel like it's time for that because I've laid the foundation and to get it to that next level would require some more resources. Which reminds me, your latest pivot was a decision to go back to consulting and working along with running the company. Is that right? 
Yeah. So, you know, running a business or starting a business does not necessarily mean you're making money, which I think most people who've started their own business have quickly realized. So it's it's shocking to me how hard it is to actually generate a paycheck for yourself um, in the beginning years. So, yeah, I've gone back to work full time um, just to help. You know, I have three kids and a husband and we live in Southern California. And so I need a paycheck. And so I went back to work full time and, you know, that's one of the things I've learned along the way is the journey is not the same for everybody and it doesn't make you less of an entrepreneur if you have to also work full time to help support your dream because that could be part of your journey too. So back to the magic wand, uh, your vision, what does this company look like three years from now? Yeah, so three years from now, I hope to have maybe some employees to help, maybe a social media team, uh, a sales team would be great, and to have grown the business beyond what I could have done myself. Uh, And then the five to 10 year plan is to definitely uh, sell the business and roll off into the sunset or something. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I was thinking about um, your earlier in your career, um, when you were working for that great brand, you guys had a traditional model, which was to develop product, sell it through wholesale channels to retailers. Today, when businesses start, they, um, they have such, such a direct-to-consumer um, marketing plan. And I wanted to get your thoughts as w- your experience. It, you know, you've talked about your, your customers being upset about Diamond Nuts, and how, how are you navigating that direct-to-consumer relationship? Yeah, that's a great question. So we put a lot of money into direct marketing this last year because I had an MBA program do a study on my company, and that was one of their suggestions is to really increase my marketing budget and to have an intentional marketing plan, which I did not have at that point. And so we, uh, I hired an, outsiding, an outside company to come and do run social media ads for us. And we were averaging about $4,000 a month on our website sales at that point. And within a couple of months, our website sales were up to $85,000 a month. So the spend was well, well worth the investment. Um, And then Facebook changed all of their algorithms. I think it was like March of last year. And privacy, their privacy uh, policy changed. And so all of a sudden, the cost per acquisition went way up. So we had to really cut back on that because very quickly, you know, our margins are slim. So 50 cents difference in cost per acquisition can put us in the red. And so we had to quickly pull back on that ad spend. Um, But we've been able to retain quite a bit of that, you know, new customer acquisition. So if I had, you know, an investment or more resources, I would absolutely put it in the direct to consumer spot because it it pays off. We have about a 40 percent uh, return customer rate. So our customers are extremely loyal. And so if we could afford a runway of investing in that for a good amount of time, we would see a lot of retention from that. So it might be good for the listeners to know how big the company's become. And, yeah. you know, I can't let go of that magic wand, how big it'll be in the next three years too. Yeah. So we did $830,000 in sales last year and we've almost doubled our sales every year since I started. And, you know, my goal, it depends on when you ask me (laughs) what, what situation I'm running into the week. My original goal was to sell the business for $30 million. And that was my goal. Um, three weeks ago, I probably would have sold it to you for a million dollars if you offered it to me. And this week I'm somewhere about three to five, (laughs) but, uh, you know, I would love to see the growth before I sell it to kn- to see that something that was in my head that is now on a shelf is also, you know, on people's dinner tables and and just, you know, become something bigger than me. So I would love to sell it for obviously millions of dollars. <laughs> As I look back on my experiences, again, I think about how I transitioned from filling one bottle at a time to buying a filling machine. And I think many of our listeners just know now I, I own a contract manufacturing company. But in your case, you went from making this in a rented kitchen space to going into contract packaging. How did that, how did that transition happen? And uh, where are you with that today? Yeah, so finding a, we call it a co-packer in the food space, which is basically someone who makes your product for you. 
is difficult. It's a really important relationship in your business. And there was quite a few co-packers in the country that do nut butters and different um, dried fruit and nuts, but there was none that I could find that had the machine to grind uh, the nuts to a powder, essentially. So I had a nut supplier that I would visit every week to go pick up my bulk nuts to make my product, and they're a dried uh, fruit and nut company in San Diego, family owned, and you know would joke around asking them to be my co-packer every week, and they just kept telling me no. And Finally, after they kept seeing my business grow week over week over week, they told me if I bought the machine, they would do my co-packing. So I found a machine company in Wisconsin who makes the machine that I needed. And we did a bunch of samples that they sent to find to make sure it was exactly um, the consistency that I needed. And so I took out a loan for $25,000 to buy that machine and took that machine three months to get here. Uh, And then it got delivered to the co-packer and it took another three months to hook the machine up because I thought you could just plug in the machine. Well, turns out the plug is like six inches in diameter and so they actually had to build an outlet to plug in the machine and get it inspected by the city and all that. So um, I think it was at about year three that the company that I had been purchasing nuts from every week uh, agreed to be my co-packer. And now they make all of my product and ship out all of our bulk pallets and and ship it to me, our will call that we fill our orders and such. So two things coming to mind. Uh, It's been a rough ride. You've shared a lot of that with us. But Mm -hmm. as we've talked to you this morning, it seems like there's a lot of joy coming out of you. Yeah. How do you explain that? Uh, Yeah. uh, and am I reading you right? Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, the journey has been super hard, but there's also been so many cool things that happen along the way. And I think when you zoom out and you're not in the daily grind and you see what you've developed, you know, I'm proud of everything that I've done. And I still obviously believe in the company. I believe in the product and I know that it has the potential to, you know, go all the way, as they say. So if you were to share with our listeners, like the the key lessons learned, the top two or three things that you you would love to share with them and it would do them the most good if they get this wild idea, what would they be? Uh, One is persistence. And you if if you have it in you to give up, it's it's not going to happen. You know, I've there's been days where I'm tired and I don't feel like it and I just want to sell or I just want to be done. And as long as you just keep taking that next step, which I know sounds cliche, but every time I've pushed through an experience and taken that next step, the company has grown and my experience has grown. So that endurance piece is extremely important. Um, I also feel like it's really important to be highly collaborative. So anytime you can have somebody who's an expert in their field speak into your business it could provide, you know, guidance or innovation or growth for you. And you just never know what's going to come from that conversation. Uh, I will listen to anybody. There's people who love to give you advice. So you obviously have to be discerning with what advice you're actually implementing. But always am open to having those conversations. Um, The other thing I say is all of those cliches, every meme that you find on social media, they're all true. (laughs) That's why they're there. And as an entrepreneur, when you see the one that has like the path going down the valley and up the mountain and just when you think you made it, you're dropped down the valley again, it's true and it's can be horrifying to be living through. But I'm excited to tell that story, hopefully someday when I'm at the other side. Let me just um, put a spotlight on something that you said that I, I think our listeners should hear, and that is that you you have joy for your business and passion for your business. And that comes from pulling yourself out of it and looking at what you have accomplished in five years. Yeah. And I think for the listening audience, you, if you're running a business, you have to take the time to work on the business, but you also have to take the time to pull back and celebrate and say, look what I've done and be proud of that. And that's where I think the passion comes through. Mm-hmm. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So uh, my inner coach is activated. I can't help myself. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, h- how do you feel about putting on a piece of paper that looks like a check 
with your name on it, $30 million, and yeah. taping that somewhere where you see it every day. Yeah, you know, I just read a book called Hero on a Mission, and it's by Donald Miller, who does some executive coaching as well. And and I've been starting some of those practices, but I'm going to do that today. I'm going to write it, and I'm going to stick it up on my wall. I've used that exact same practice many times. Um, my special spot is the bathroom mirror where I brush my teeth, so I'm forced to see that every single day. And has it worked? Absolutely. And I wrote down three things I wanted to accomplish in three years and I accomplished them in one because of that constant reminder mm. of uh, what I wanted to do with my life. Well, and you just might find that you'll tear it down and put one up that says 35. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say 15. <laughs> Susan, I have used your product. I'm a uh, paleo keto person, so um, I love these kinds of products and your product is awesome. Where can our audience find it? You can find our product at nutcrumbs.com, and it's also in many retailers. You can use the store locator on our website. You can also find us on Instagram. Our handle is at nutcrumbs, one word. And if you do listen to this podcast and you want to purchase a bag on our website, you can use the coupon code FTOB20 and redeem 20% off your purchase. FTOB, that's from the owner's box, mm -hmm. 20. Yes. Susan, thank you so much for your time today and sharing your life with us. And I feel like you were really a genuine and transparent. And we really appreciate that because the listening audience is going to get a lot of great golden nuggets. Don, thank you again for always uh, co-chairing this with me. You bet. This was exciting. You know, to be with somebody who's in the midst of hitting their stride has probably been the most exciting podcast so far. Right. And with that, we'll see you next time.